Hi. Um, so we will start now our roundtable on carbon capture and utilization, the road to renewable carbon. We'll start with Thibaut Cantat from CEO Aliten, who's going to present uh, on sustainable fuels from disruptive technologies to demonstration projects. Thank you. Thank you very much, Franklin, for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to, to meet you all here. And so, so my goal for you is to set the scene uh, for the discussion for today. So what I'm going to talk about are, of course, sustainable fuels, not just biofuels, but also e-fuels. So just uh, what I'm going to try and do is focus as an example on the French context, although, if, of course, what I'm going to present is really uh, a European, I would say, vision of what to do on sustainable fuels. If we just look at uh, the, the French energy system, and that would be quite similar in many countries, uh, of course we are utilizing a lot of carbon products in our energy system. Why? Because uh, carbon products are mostly uh, fossil-based carbon products coming from oil, coal, and gas are utilized for two different kinds of applications. Of course, the production of energy, but also the utilization of carbon products in other sectors. In the aim for, when we are aiming for the energy transition and to reach net zero emissions, the idea is to replace, of course, this fossil part of our energy mix with non-fossil alternatives, meaning to go for electrification uh, of the utilization of fossil resources. Nonetheless, we need to recognize the fact that about a third of the uses of carbon products can not be substituted with alternatives such as electrification, utilization of H2 technologies or batteries. The reason why is because some carbon-based products, about uh, 46 megaton oil equivalents in France, are utilized for the production of liquid fuels for long-range transportation, especially in the aviation, but also in the maritime transport, but also the production of materials in which we have carbon atoms, like uh, materials such as steel, cast iron, etc., but also organic chemicals such as plastics. So this problem of uh, having carbon products in the future in a net zero economy means that we need to consider a circular carbon economy. And it's fairly new that the IPCC reports consider the fate of those carbon products. And in 2022, the IPCC report recognized the fact that carbon is a key building block in organic chemicals, but also in fuels and materials, and they will remain important, meaning that we're gonna have to develop a circular bioeconomy concept and even a circular carbon economy concept so that we can maintain those carbon products in the future. So this is an invitation to look at the carbon cycle today. What do we do uh, in a carbon economy? Here is just represented, I would say about 85% of the world energy portfolio where we extract and exploit fossil, fossil resources for two main applications, the production of fumes and of course the production of chemicals which derive from the valorization of all the side products from the refining of oil. Of course, afterwards, after utilization of fuels and chemicals, in a short or longer uh, time, carbon will accumulate in the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide, which is basically the energy-deprived form of carbon. Starting from CO2 accumulating in the atmosphere, one possibility to reach a net uh, zero economy is to capture carbon dioxide in order to store it and that's, of course, what we call CCS, carbon capture and storage. So as you can see, this is still a linear carbon economy that I am picturing here on this scheme, meaning that we could uh, reach net zero emissions using uh, CCS technologies, but we will remain in a linear economy where at some point we either exhaust the fossil resources or the capacities to store carbon dioxide. So how could we move to a circular carbon economy as is emphasized uh, in the IPCC report. This means that we would move towards the capture and utilization of carbon dioxide. And to be able to do that, to produce chemicals and fuels again from CO2, we need to inject, of course, a lot of energy. Ideally, utilizing renewable energies, such as solar energy, most likely in the short run, utilizing H2 coming from the electrolysis of water using green electricity or low carbon electricity coming from a nuclear power plants to convert CO2 and hydrogen together in hydrogenation technologies to promote the formation of fuels and or chemicals. I would argue that in the longer run, uh, we could shortcut the value chain for the production of fuels and chemicals by directly utilizing electricity 
or even uh, sunlight in the conversion of CO2 to produce e-fuels and solar fuels in a much shorter way. Biomass uh, is a key element in a circular carbon economy. Why? Because you can see biomass as a concentrated source of carbon dioxide coming from the atmosphere and a concentrated source of sunlight. Meaning that photosynthesis has already pre-concentrated CO2, uh, atmospheric CO2 and sunlight. So how could we define uh, a circular carbon economy? It is basically the collection of all the technologies which are able to convert CO2 but also uh, derivatives, such as com derivatives coming from biomass, into useful products, namely chemicals and fuels, of course utilizing low carbon energies to achieve carbon uh, neutrality with a positive environmental and societal impact. I would argue that uh, this raison d'etre uh, for, for e-fuels, uh, for e-chemicals has been much, uh, much stronger since 2022 when the European regulation kicked in with the Fit for 55 uh, package, setting a trajectory both uh, for the aviation sector and for the maritime transportation. I would focus my presentation mostly on the aviation because it's a bit easier to follow in terms of uh, market shares uh, that are targeted in the regulation. And when we look at the number, what the regulation is setting is that by 2050, we need to include 70% of sustainable aviation fuels in, uh, in our planes. 70% of uh, sustainable fuels, this is not just one simple target, there is a second target, the fact that we need about 35% of synthetic fumes, so e-fuels coming from the conversion of CO2, to avoid putting too much pressure on the utilization of biomass. An interesting aspect of the regulation is the fact that uh, the EU Commission is not giving us a target for 2050, that would be, uh, I would say, a long-range target, but it is also setting targets in the midterm. For instance, in 2035, we already need to produce 5% of synthetic fuels and include 20% of sustainable fuels for the aviation. So how do we make uh, sustainable fuels? Uh, I would just set up the scene with a very simple picture to highlight the value chain for the production of e-fuels, biofuels, and hybrids like e-biofuels, which I'm going to present. First, we need to capture uh, the, the carbon matter, either utilizing the capture of CO2 from the atmosphere or from point sources, but we can also think about the valorization of carbon coming from biomass or from recycled products. Once carbon is concentrated, we need to convert it with an energy vector, the primary one uh, in, the sh in the most mature value chains for the production of e-fumes is hydrogen coming from the electrolysis of water powered, of course, using low carbon electricity. Once carbon and dihydrogen are produced together, a conversion, which is typically a thermocatalytic process or a sequence of different thermocatalytic processes, will allow you to produce a fuel or a chemical. So there are major leverages in this value chain. The fact that we need, of course, a lot of low carbon electricity and heat. Electrolysis is a key technological brick which will allow the production of dihydrogen. And of course, we need mature technologies to efficiently capture carbon dioxide, especially from the atmosphere. What does it mean uh, for the aviation sector in France and in Europe? So if we focus in France, the aviation sector is emitting about 20 megatons of carbon dioxide every year, which comes from the fact that we utilize fossil kerosene, about seven megatons of fossil kerosene uh, in France. If I just focus on the two main airports in France, in the Paris area, so the Charles de Gaulle and Orly airports, they consume five megatons of kerosene every year. In Europe, it's quite easy to uh, derive uh, numbers from Europe. It's about 10 times the magnitude of the Paris airports, meaning that we consume 50 megatons of kerosene every year in Europe. So how could we make uh, low carbon uh, fumes starting from carbon dioxide and electricity? In the lower uh, right corner of this slide, you will see the basic recipe in terms of the ingredients which are necessary to convert CO2 into e-kerosene. To convert, to produce one ton of e-kerosene, what you need are 37 megawatt hours of electricity, five tons of carbon dioxide, and 6.5 tons of water. Why am I picturing those numbers? 
It's because now we can combine together this recipe with the new regulation coming from the European Commission to see what are the resources that we need to mobilize for the production of e-fumes in the coming decades. So if we follow the regulation, producing 5% of e-fumes and e-kerosene by 2035, this means that for the Paris uh, airports, we're gonna have to produce about 250 kilotons of e-kerosene. Meaning that we're gonna have to devote 9.3 terawatt hours of electricity to capture 1.3 megatons of carbon dioxide and convert this carbon dioxide with electricity into kerosene. In terms of resources, this represents about one new generation nuclear uh, reactor to power this uh, amount of electricity, or if you prefer in terms of renewable energies, it represents about 300 uh, windmills. By 2050, we need to multiply all those numbers by seven. By 2050, but at the European uh, scale, we need to multiply all those numbers by 10. So this tells us right away what is one of the main leverage we have to focus uh, in the coming decades, which is the production of low carbon electricity to be able to power the energy transition and how to reach uh, net zero emissions in the future for all the sectors, not just the aviation, but also the maritime transportation, etc., etc. To be complete, uh, I need to, of course, talk about the production cost of e-kerosene. So it's hard to, of course, determine a very precise cost because it's going to depend heavily on the cost of electricity plus on the maturity of all the technologies and the value chains. But for roughly, uh, the price for e-kerosene is targeted at two to four euros per liter, where the current price uh, is about 40 cents coming from fossil resources. So uh, because of this regulation, uh, there is really a new dynamic, I would say, uh, in the industry, in research organisms, in the academia even. And here is a, is a map of all the projects targeting the production of sustainable aviation, aviation fumes in France. So you can see many projects coming from the utilization either of biomass or directly uh, the production of e-fumes. I'm not fo gonna focus on all of them, just give you uh, two or three examples. So let's uh, start with the power to X approaches. So in a power to, pricks, to X sorry, uh, value chain, what you want to do is convert together carbon dioxide, that is first capture, and to convert carbon dioxide with hydrogen coming from the electrolysis of water. One example for the production of methane uh, in a power to gas approach is the Jupiter Mill uh, project, which is the development of a methanation uh, production plant uh, coming from the utilization of carbon dioxide, which is captured, to production schemes for the production of hydrogen by electrolysis, either by alkaline electrolysis or pen uh, electrolysis, so that CO2 and the hydrogen can be combined together in a methanation unit. And for instance, CA, the research teams, the re and the innovation teams at CA have developed a very a highly performance methanation unit, which is able to cope with the fact that the conversion of CO2 and hydrogen together is extremely exothermic. So you need to evacuate the heat as soon as it is uh, produced so that you avoid destroying the catalytic systems, which are able to convert selectively CO2 and hydrogen together into methane. The key figures in this project, you can see that the scale in terms of power is a uh, 500 uh, kilowatt of electricity, which is able to produce uh, at the end of the project about 22 uh, cubic meters of methane per hour. In power to X approaches, of course, the production of kerosene is important, especially for the aviation. Here are just two examples uh, coming from uh, different companies. So NG is piloting one project, which is called Kerosene in the north of France, targeting the production of 70 kilotons of e-kerosene by 2028, in collaboration uh, with CMA CGM and Air France KLM. And on the other side, Take Air is a project that is led uh, by uh, EDF, so the main French electricity company, uh, targeting also the production of e-kerosene from CO2 and electro electrolytic dihydrogen. The two projects are very similar, both in terms of scales, but also in terms of technologies, because when we focus on the conversion units, which will allow the conversion of CO2 and hydrogen together, the typical value chain is to convert first CO2 and hydrogen together in a so-called reverse water gas shift reaction to produce a syngas, so a mixture of hydrogen and CO from CO2, 
and then to feed this mixture of gases into a fissure trap process to yield uh, a crude mixture that is then formulated into a fuel. As I mentioned in a circular economy pathway, CO2 is not the only source of carbon that you can utilize. Of course, the utilization of biomass is extremely appealing. So many projects are dealing with the utilization of biomass to produce fumes, meaning biofuels, but an input version is to try and utilize all the carbon matter that is contained into biomass to convert all the carbon into a usable fuel or into a usable chemical. So in a power and biomass to X approach, what you want to do is to take biomass to convert it to, for instance, using a gasification process to generate a gas and to convert completely this gas and all the carbon matter that is contained in the gas by the addition of electrolytic dihydrogen so that you can produce fumes and chemicals. An example of such uh, a process, such a value chain, is the Metarine project, which is a European project aiming at boosting the production of biomethane from carbon wastes. Although in a typical uh, fermentation process, you will only, only valorize part of the carbon matter, if you introduce green hydrogen, you add more green hydrogen, and you convert the digestate of your um, anaerobic digestion by gasification and addition of green hydrogen, you can convert and aim for the conversion of most of the carbon matter that is contained in the organist waste. In this project, uh, which has started uh, two years ago, the conversion of carbon uh, that is targeted is above 80%. And if you are interested in this kind of project, you can look at, at the detailed presentation by Geneviève Geoffrey from CEA at 3.30 in the other room. To close my uh, presentation, uh, I will, of course, give you a very short glimpse at what could be disruptive technologies, how we can move from traditional biofuels or e-biofuels or even e-fuels going directly to solar fuels. In solar fuels, you can shortcut the production of green electricity and utilize directly sunlight, for instance, in the production of dihydrogen so that dihydrogen and CO2 will be converted together into an e-fuel or an e-chemical. As an example, CA has led one uh, project which, uh, which has participated to the finale of the Horizon Prize uh, concours uh, last year, two years ago, sorry, in 2022, on artificial photosynthesis for the production of fumes from the sun. So CA developed a very innovative demonstrator for the production of solar fuel, especially the formation of solar methane, by using an integrated photoelectrocatalytic cell, which is able to convert water and sunlight together into dihydrogen. And dihydrogen was utilized in the presence of carbon dioxide in a bioreactor for the production of methane. And those kind of bio hybrids uh, system where we use physical chemical techniques for the conversion, for instance, of water into dihydrogen and biological approaches for the conversion of CO2 allowed us to reach uh, state-of-the-art yields in the production of solar methanes directly from solar energy. So with that, uh, I invite you, uh, if you're interested, to join the Litten Days, which we is going to be a big event at CA this year in March, early March, uh, where we're going to celebrate the 20th uh, anniversary of the Litten Days. If you're interested in networking on problematics around the energy transition, you are more than welcome in Grenoble. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Thibault. Um, we'll have actually a Q&A at the end for all the panelists, but uh, we can already take one question, maybe. Is there, a, is there a question? Yeah, at the back. Uh, just a question of uh, efficiency between the different processes uh, regarding the end fuel. Uh, do you see a big difference when you are using this technology to produce emethane, emethanol, e-kerosene, and uh, do you think there is an optimization to be made? Thank you. Yes, so, so, so the main factors that you want to optimize are three factors. What is the yield in terms of the utilization of carbon? Because capturing CO2 is, is costly. 
what is the efficiency in terms of energy efficiency, because I highlighted the fact that electricity is going to be a scare resource, and what is the efficiency in terms of the overall cost. Uh, I would say it really depends on the molecule you are targeting. For instance, if you look at how much carbon is converted in the hydrogenation of CO2, I would go for methane because this is a very selective transformation where you can convert completely all the CO2 into methane. But if you are in the fuel se in the aviation sector, you are not much interested by methane, so you're going to want some e-kerosene. And in this case, uh, it's a competition between the different technologies for the production of kerosene of kerosene that you have to compare. For instance, do we go for a fischer tropsch process or do we go through a methanol process? Thank you, Thibault. Now we have a presentation by Erika. Erika works for the Finnish Bioenergy Association where she is a specialist on carbon removals and CCUS, and she's going to talk about the state of play and policy developments regarding Beku in Finland. Thank you. So, uh, if you were here this morning, then um, you might uh, might have heard my uh, presentation then. But uh, hopefully, I have some some new information in this presentation for those guys as well. So, uh, my name is Erika Lailahti. Um, <laughs> sorry for the last name. Um, and I work uh, in the Bioenergy Association of Finland. Um, and here's just a picture of our small group. Um, we are a business association representing over 250 uh, member organizations. Uh, we represent the whole whole uh, value chain from from landowners to forest and energy companies all the way to the technology in the field. And uh, without going into further details of what we do, I can just say that our main goal is to make Finland the best place in the world to create bio-based, sustainable, and even carbon-negative solutions. Um, and uh, in this work, uh, I have a couple of uh, forums that help us and me. And uh, one of them is uh, carbon, remo carbon Removal and CCUS Committee. Um, uh, that I'm running. And uh, another one is a biochar network um, that uh, concentrates on biochar development, which is actually quite uh, booming in Finland as well, although I will not be talking about that uh, in this presentation. Um, but I guess before we uh, dive into the uh, carbon capture uh, part of the presentation, I guess we can start with the sort of the basic Finnish uh, key climate policy targets so that you kind of understand where we are coming from in these projects and, and what is the environment that we're working in. So uh, we have a quite um, ambitious climate neutrality target. So we are trying to be climate neutral by 2035, so in 11 years. Um, this target uh, is uh, in law, so we we need to achieve this in one way or another. Um, and we have been doing quite quite well in the emissions reductions side of the picture. And uh, it's the sink part of that we uh, are currently facing more more troubles. But I think um, bio. Uh, biogenic CO2 and uh, capturing biogenic CO2, m uh, using it in different products or storing it uh, and creating carbon removals is going to be uh, in the heart of achieving this goal. But we currently do not have any any targets uh, for technological sinks or carbon capture, but, but um, something has happened already. So, um, like you might know, if you if you have been following the Finnish discussion for some reason, uh, we are pretty excited about hydrogen, like uh, some other countries as well. But um, our government uh, adopted a resolution earlier. Um, oh, no, oh, sorry, we are already in 2024. So last year, uh, about a year ago, uh, that uh, Finland aims to become a European leader in hydrogen economy. So we are aiming to uh, produce at least 10% of the EU's clean hydrogen in 2030. 
So this is quite a, quite a big uh, target. And we have some, um, some financing uh, available for, for these uh, projects. Um, then I guess um, to kind of paint the picture of how uh, Finland sees the carbon capture, utilization, storage, the whole bundle, we have mostly been focusing on utilization. And that has been um, announced also in our national energy and climate plan that was um, submitted to the commission last year, uh, where our government said that utilization of captured CO2 is a clear focus area, and we do have several projects already ongoing, um, mostly focusing on synthetic fuels. Um, and then um, other things that have been uh, happening lately um, uh, that are uh, uh, linked to the projects and making them happen is that um, we have uh, um, created this priority treatment for projects so that, uh, as we know, uh, these large-scale projects do have very long lead times so that this is kind of something that the government can do. So we do have priority treatment um, uh, in the project um, uh, regarding CCUS um, in the permit procedures. So this is quite a, uh, this is something that the EU is also working on, but we have been kind of uh, uh, moving forward faster um, nationally already. Uh, then I guess um, Tibo talked a lot about the synthetic fuels, and thank you for that. Uh, you kind of painted a picture of, of that scene uh, very well. Um, and nationally, we do have um, uh, RFMBOs uh, recently integrated in the distribution mandate nationally in the transport sector. So this is something that the, the government is doing so that we create the demand and kind of uh, create trust for the, for the investors to go forward with the projects. And we do have some, some uh, national investment aid uh, already granted for projects in carbon capture and synthetic fuels. But without, uh, I, I have to say this uh, once again, I already mentioned it in, uh, in the morning, um, our uh, current government um, made a clear new strategic opening last year with, it, with the government program uh, giving a clear uh, new focus on CCUS solutions as uh, key climate priorities uh, in the Finnish climate policy. And in this regard, the government clearly stated that uh, Finland has a competitive advantage in bio CCU. Um, I guess it's quite uh, kind of clear. One reason is that uh, we do not have storage potential in Finland and we are quite far away from the from the closest project, so this is uh, one clear driver. But uh, the uh, hydrogen was also mentioned that uh, comparing biogenic CO2 uh, with the increased hydrogen production uh, creates an excellent platform uh, for producing different kind of products, uh, fuels, chemicals, or, or other materials. And uh, to kind of uh, outline the greatest uh, or the most ambitious target of this program. Uh, it's uh, this one uh, that the government said that by 2035, there will be no CO2 emissions going into the atmosphere from large point sources in Finland. So this will mean a lot of carbon capture. And then what happens after that uh, remains to be seen. Um, but um, if we uh, compare ourselves to the um, other EU countries um, who have ambitious goals in uh, CCU or CCS, we are a bit less, uh, less fortunate in the financing side, so we do not have, a, have as big pockets as, for example, Denmark or uh, Sweden in, uh, um, in supporting the projects, but we have uh, some money available. And here's just to show you the picture that um, we have quite a lot of biogenic CO2 in Finland. So uh, the green uh, in those uh, little uh, balls is uh, biogenic CO2. So um, of course, uh, this is largely due to our uh, forest industry, but we do have a lot of biogenic CO2 also in the energy industry. So 
28 million tons per year, a huge potential, and uh, this is uh, clearly uh, been noticed since we do have quite a, quite a couple of uh, projects uh, coming up. Um, if we look at the, the other possible pathway, so we do have a lot of these uh, point sources in the coast, so we could also uh, um, transport the CO2 to storage or transport the CO2 to somewhere else. Uh, for other purposes, so that's possible. But then we also do have a lot of point sources inland. So um, the inland um, sources are, of course, uh, then uh, maybe more more uh, looking into the utilization pathways. And like I mentioned, um, we do not have the geological storage uh, sites uh, identified in our own land, so uh, we are very much uh, dependent on uh, international collaboration in this matter. Um, so I guess uh, it's quite clear that uh, the utilization pathway uh, is more uh, it gives an advantage in a way that you don't have to wait for the storage to be be there because um, that is not something that is on your uh, your um, hands only. Um, but I I heard uh, a conversation earlier when uh, you you gave the presentation uh, before lunch and there were the questions of uh, uh, energy efficiency and, and price, etc. So just to point out why uh, Finland is quite, uh, quite a prominent place to consider uh, making these fuels is that uh, for one, we have a lot of renewable energy, but then two, we also have uh, a lot of emission-free energy. So our grid is about 90% uh, emission-free, uh, um, so that is a clear advantage if we, if you uh, think about making making uh, the utilization projects happening. Um, and then some other uh, other aspects that uh, uh, can can make um, that are Finnish advantages in this field. Um, like I mentioned, uh, clean and also robust electricity system. So grid is quite, uh, quite uh, great, and the price of the electricity that is a clear, a clear advantage. Uh, last year, I think uh, Finland was among the, if not the cheapest, but among top three uh, cheapest electricity prices for, um, th uh, if uh, we look at the price outside households. So. So clear advantage in that. And then we all, uh, electrol uh, electrolysis needs uh, clean water. We have a lot of it. And then, uh, of course, the biogenic CO2. And on top of this, uh, we do have a lot of technological expertise in this matter. And we have been uh, doing a lot of research regarding uh, both uh, CCS in the early years and in the most recent years, uh, a lot of uh, research uh, looking into the utilization and uh, different value chains regarding that. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, permitting procedures are quite uh, quite s swiftly and, uh, um, and the government is really supportive in making these projects happen. And uh, yeah, I already mentioned about this. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I guess I could uh, add on that, uh, that um, when we're talking about the, the companies are trying to figure out if they should uh, go on the utilization or storage uh, pathway, then I guess um, one driver towards the utilization pathway has also been a bit of a, a clearer business case. I'm not saying that it's so clear ev in every case, but maybe a bit clearer. And then, of course, these uh, clear synergies uh, with the transport biofuels activities that we have been doing a long time. And uh, here are just a couple of uh, the most recent uh, or ongoing research projects uh, regarding especially uh, bio CCU. And there are actually quite uh, good uh, materials uh, in English um, um, on this website. So if you're interested, then I. I suggest you take a look. And here, um, there's a list of uh, announced uh, biofuels and synthetic fuels projects. And we 
uh, have uh, calculated that um, all of these announced projects would require about 1.1 million tons of biogenic CO2 annually. So quite significant amount. But then again, if we compare it to the uh, potential that we have, then uh, we do have a lot of room for more. Um, and as you can see, most of these projects uh, have been going to the synthetic methane uh, pathway, which is, uh, Tibor told, the uh, advantages in that. And, and of course, I have to mention that uh, one driver for that can also be that uh, Finland is sort of an island uh, in the north of Europe, so we do have a lot of uh, uh, maritime needs of our own, uh, so kind of uh, uh, demand uh, is uh, quite uh, clear uh, regarding that one. Uh, but I then uh, it's not just the fuels. Uh, it's mostly fuels now, but we do have up and coming other uh, interesting solutions in uh, utilization. So uh, here are a couple of examples. So Carbonade is a startup that uh, is creating uh, carbon negative concrete. So um, and they have uh, biogenic CO2 as part of their production. And another interesting example is uh, another startup called Solar Foods uh, that use uh, CO2 um, in creating protein. Um, they use direct air capture there, but anyways, carbon capture and uh, utilization. Um, and to summarize all of this, I would say that we have huge potential for back, uh, back both uh, bio CCU and bio uh, CCS. And uh, I think we will become a massive force in reducing emissions and producing negative emissions. And we can also provide these services for, for other countries and uh, operators. But uh, then if we look at the bigger picture, and I, I once again, I think, Thibault, you you talked about it, the circular economy, and that, I think, is the future. And how do we get from this pic uh, this point into the uh, that kind of world where we are going uh, more in towards the circular economy thinking, and that is something I think that we need to address uh, at the EU level. I think we need a uh, clearer vision and more of a strategic commitment on CCU in a broader context, not just as part of hydrogen economy pathway, but in a broader sense. But uh, that that's all, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Erika. Um, well, we could take one question. But it was actually, I have one, because you were mentioning just at the end the role of CC, um, U the European Union for CCU, CCS. Um, and you talked quite a lot during your presentation about CCU fuels, renewable fuels. Um, on that sense, and it makes also the link with Tibo, we have a legislation now at the European level for uh, the maritime sector and for the aviation sector. It's going to have to be implemented now in Finland? Are you already working on it? And what can the public sector, the also the actors in that sector, do at that national level? Well, I guess uh, the, the projects kind of show that we are uh, in uh, very much uh, involved in making those, those targets, uh, trying to the EU be able to reach those targets. Um, but as I mentioned, I think the kind of, uh, uh, there is no, like you mentioned in your presentation, we don't have a legislation solely focusing on CCU uh, or any other paper even, just some kind of uh, outlining uh, solely focusing on CCU. So I think maybe there should be something that kind of puts all of these uh, pieces into one basket and and uh, kind of uh, makes it easier also for national uh, level um, uh, policymakers, but also the actual actors to understand that okay, what is needed and where is kind of the where is the the future going to be? Maybe that's a uh, credo for the next European Commission. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thank you.
So now the, we have our third and last panelist, Tim, who comes to us from ERGAR, which is the European Renewable Gas Registry, where he is the Secretary General. Tim? Yes, thank you. So I introduce Tim Hammer, Secretary General of ERGAR. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the future of biogenic CO2 certification. Uh, and I maybe want to start with lowering the expectations a bit. I'm not going to tell you how it will look like, but I will tell you why we need it and what's the direction of thinking. What are the open questions we still have? Maybe a short introduction of Ergar. Uh, as Renewable Gas Registry, we have kind of two roles. On the one hand, we facilitate the cross-border transfers of biomethane certificates. They're the guarantees or certificates of origin, like in France, you have uh, used to have GRDF as the national registry, and now you have EEX. Um, we make sure that the national registries can trade amongst each other. And at the same time, we provide a forum for all stakeholders in the biomethane certification supply chain. So these are the distribution system operators, uh, traders, uh, biogas associations, and the national registries. So we bring them together and we discuss everything related to biomethane and renewable gas. And during one of these discussions, we also ran into the issue of uh, biogenic CO2 and certification. And then we realized that there's nothing really happening here yet. So we thought this might be a good moment to, to start the discussion, get everybody around the table and see um, what can happen here. Um, maybe a star biogenic CO2. I think this has been discussed many times today, so I won't go into de detail on this presentation. The only point I want to make is that for Ergar and its members, biogenic CO2 is sustainable, and for many companies, they're willing to pay for that. Uh, many big corporates, uh, they're willing to pay for biogenic CO2 in comparison to fossil CO2. Um, <coughs> And that's why we believe there's a need for certification. Um, yes, the rest I won't explain now. The same for this slide. Uh, carbon can be used in many sectors. It was just mentioned already. Cement, uh, methane, food industry, and demand is going up. So it might not be a big market at the moment, but the market for biogenic CO2 will increase the same what we expect for the market for certification. Um, yes, so why do we need biogenic CO2 certification? As mentioned already, we have two main reasons. On the one hand, it provides financial incentives for the producers of biogenic CO2. Um, let's say a biomethane plants, at the moment, if they want to capture, or they capture already CO2, but if they want to make use of it, it will cost money. Uh, so there need to be an extra, uh, can be an extra reward for this. At the same time, it might be an extra source of income for biomethane producers if they want to make an investment decision. So this could be a useful tool to further make Europe more sustainable. Um, that's one reason. The other reason is the proof of origin for of the CO2 for companies and end users. Um, in the food industry, many companies want to be sustainable. Uh, the aviation fuels were discussed, uh, e-methane were discussed. Um, to make a really circular carbon markets, we need to have some proof that the CO2 that's used is um, renewable. Um, and the best way, or one of the ways, is certification. How is that done? At the moment, uh, there are several options to do it. The first one is lowering the carbon intensity of the biomethane production in the proof of sustainability. Uh, I think this is a very technical one. I'll try and explain it in two sentences. Proof of sustainability is some kind of certificate you get to show how much greenhouse gas uh, emissions there are for your biomethane. If you capture the CO2, this will be reduced and you can put this on your certificate and you can ask more money for it. That's how you can capture, besides capturing the physical CO2, you can also capture the value of the CO2. A second option is a new carbon removal certificate legislation. Um, this also works if you store 
the carbon in one way or another. Um, and this is not what we're thinking about. We're talking about the use of the biogenic CO2, for example, for the e-fuels or the food industry or any other chemical. And at the moment, there's no certification or there's a limited structure for certification yet. I know there are some uh, companies doing it, but not a European-wide framework to organize this. <coughs> um, the only thing that sometimes does, or that's the most common way, is that the biogenic CO2 is sold directly to the end users um, to be used for bio e kerosene, for example. Um, so this is the focus of our thinking at the moment, like this number three, the biogenic CO2 certification for usage. So if you have CO2, biogenic, that you want to use for a specific case, how can you prove that this CO2 is um, sustainable? Of course, that's easy when you just get it from biomethane certification plants and use it in your production. But a step further, how do they know? You need to have some kind of system behind it. Um, and Ergar, we worked on such a system of traceability, tracking, certification for the biomethane. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel, but we can look at these certificates for inspiration. Uh, I won't go into detail into this completely because it's a different topic, but I can briefly go over it. You have the guarantee of origin. Some of you may know it. The idea is that you use it for consumer disclosure in the voluntary market based on the Renewable Energy Directive and the European standards. Uh, and it's issued by a national reg registry, a government appoint issuing body, like at the moment EEX is in France, um, but for example, Vertisere in the Netherlands. Uh, the system is book and claim, so that means you send the gas in one direction and the other direction you send a certificate and it no doesn't need to be linked as long as every the producer and the user are connected to the EU gas grid. And the tracking is done by national registries. So in the national registries, you have accounts, and there you can see who's the owner of these certificates. And when you transfer it, you inform the, the registry, say, okay, now we need to go to this account. So it's a solid system. Another option is the proof of sustainability, also coming from the Renewable Energy Directive. And this main purpose is target counting. So there are uh, certain targets for biomethane sustainable uh, production. And if you have a proof of sustainability, this can be counted for this target. Or for example, in the transport sector. It also means you need to meet more sustainability requirements. Uh, and here the system is slightly different because it's the producer himself that issues the certificate. He can do it when he's approved by a voluntary scheme, and a voluntary scheme is again uh, approved by the legislation or by the European Commission. Um, but it's a different way of certification. <coughs> and sometimes the national databases, sometimes not. It's also a dis different system of tracking, because it's mass balancing, which means that the idea behind it that the renewable gas, the biomethane, follows the supply chain, uh, or follows with the certificate, the supply chain. <coughs> and finally, on the tracking, at the moment, there's no, there's no database behind it. It's just traders send a PDF document from, <coughs> uh, from one supplier to another, and they need to keep their own registry that's uh, audited once a year. This will change in the future with the Union Database, different story, but it gives you a bit of an idea what's possible with these type of certificates. So now, the biogenic CO2 certification. Uh, yes, there are many uh, possibilities. Uh, we now only looked at these biomethane certification because that's what we know well within Ergar. Uh, there are ETS certificates, there are now carbon removal uh, certificates. So how will it look like or what's the best way uh, how it looks like? That first of all depends a bit on how the market will be uh, organized. How will the logistics look like? Um, 
I understand sometimes it's done by truck. In the future, pipelines might be more common. Will there be several or a limited number of parties controlling the whole supply chain, or will it be a more open market? Um, that's uh, a question that impacts what kind of certification market should be. Uh, another question is, what will the market demand? Will they want real biogenic CO2 that follows the certificates? Or are they fine with using industrial CO2, fossil CO2, and buy somewhere else certificates and combine it? <coughs> or they're fine with it as long as it's blended at one moment um, to have the opportunity that it's biogenic CO2? Also a question mark. Uh, and another one is, how will the legislation be implemented? Uh, new legislation that's coming up, the Carbon Removal Directive. I think it's in the final phases. Um, and in two weeks, we expect the Industrial Carbon Management communication from the European Commission. Um, <coughs> what will be written here uh, also impacts how the certification market could look like. So that's a bit how we, why we need the certification. What can be based on? What is the uncertainty? And the next step is the questions. What are the questions and possibilities we have which setting up such a system? <coughs> the first one is who will issue the certificates? Will it be the national registry, like for a guarantee of origin? Will it be the producer himself when he's audited by uh, some sort of voluntary scheme of another organization? Both have their, their pros and cons. The same with the next two ones, who will audit the facilities? Is it also the National Registry or the voluntary schemes? And then another interesting point is how will the measurements be verified? For biomethane, it's the, the DSO or the TSO that has access to the, the gas meter. But how does it work with CO2? Because how I understand it, sometimes it's measured by weight, by the truck, and sometimes by a flow meter. Do we have a conversion factor? How and who will check these instruments? <coughs> uh, another question is how the certificates will be traded. And that's, of course, very much of interest to AirGuard because uh, our sales and our members are very active in this. Will there be PDF documents sent from one party to another with an annual audit, maybe, of all the traders? Or will there be accounts in centralized or decentralized databases and where the decentralized base databases should be able to trade. Another question, the mass balance system or the book and claim system, a bit coming back to the question on if the uh, market will be fine with buying fossil CO2 and buy a certificate somewhere else, or they really want that the CO2 they use in their food products to claim on the packaging we are completely sustainable with biogenic CO2 is really physical biogenic CO2. Uh, another one with all this legislation coming up, like the proof of sustainability, the carbon removal certificates, you don't want to count it twice. So you don't want to have this biogenic CO2 be sold with a separate certificate and at the same time use this biogenic CO2 to lower the value for the greenhouse gas calculations for the proof of sustainability. What's the best way here? Do you want to check the bookkeeping of the producers? Or do you want several databases that are able to communicate with each other to avoid any double counting? And I think the final one, how is it connected to the existing legislation? Uh, ETS, but also just mentioned the Refuel EU Aviation, the RFMBOs for Red 3. Ideally, if you have a biogenic CO2 certificate, it can be used to prove that uh, a non-biological fuel is renewable. Um, unfortunately, I don't have all the answers. Uh, we have some ideas. Uh, here and there, we have the pros and cons. But then, we uh, discussed it earlier this week, it's one big puzzle. Because one aspect impacts the other, and if you have the national registries doing the audits of the plants, it makes more sense that they also keep track of the ownership. <coughs> um, but 
maybe one option is what better for one aspect than for the other. So what we believe is that there should be a whole framework being developed and all pieces of the puddle need to be need to fit. Um, yes, and is that for Ergar to do? Uh, no, not really. We believe that this is uh, a job for the full market, for everybody uh, that's interested. Also, if one of you is interested in, the, in this topic and thinks you'd like to join the discussions, uh, please let me know. What we are doing now as Ergar is we try to speak to as many stakeholders as possible and try to work together to see what needs to be done as an industry. And maybe there's nothing to be done for Ergar, we don't know. But we do believe there should be a market for biogenic CO2 uh, certificates because there is the demand from the end users to know if their CO2 is biogenic. And we see that there is a demand from the producers of biomethane to get extra value for the biogenic CO2 they provide. So this just gives a bit of an idea about the biogenic CO2 market that there probably will come something, but there are many open questions and I hope soon we'll have a bit more answers, but for now you have a bit of an idea what's being discussed. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Tim. Um, is there a question for Tim? No. Well, I, I have one. Um, you mentioned just at the end that um, certification for biogenic CO2 could also be used for uh, certifying the RFMBOs. It's for RFMBOs, I know that you also need to certify the hydrogen origin, the electricity. How complex is that certification system for biogenic CO2 and overall? Um, and how that does that impact your work? That's a very good question. So, especially we know that for uh, e-methane, there's been the first certificates uh, being issued in Denmark. Um, but there was not a real biogenic CO2 certificate behind it. It's just a direct um, supply. Um, so it depends a bit on the newly approved voluntary schemes for the RFMBOs. But I, I have a f my best guess is that the link to make the link shouldn't be too complicated. Uh, but it depends a bit on the requirements the voluntary scheme sets. But I would s say that we should be able to develop a certificate, a biogenic CO2 certificate, that can just be accepted by... ...to claim something is a renewable uh, fuel. Thank you. Yes. Well... Do you want to sit, Tim? Thank you very much. Um, my name is Miguel. I work for a company called Gas Lab that is dedicated over 60 years in uh, carbon dioxide technology. Okay, so we've been in business for quite some time. Um, I hear you speak and it's very interesting and uh, on the way I feel it's some kind of a double-edged sword because you probably know that today the only certification that you can find in the business for food is the Coca-Cola certification. Today you go for CO2 and you say, okay, we're going to uh, food grade that's Coca-Cola, and that's it. Now, on the other hand, Coca-Cola will not accept uh, CO2 that comes from a bio origin because they are afraid of smell. So my question to you, is there any kind of direction or objective in your, in your organization to uh, direct the possibilities of all the producers to a product that is uh, uh, commercial, uh, commercially viable? Because today, the bio CO2 has relatively little exits, uh, little uh, possibilities to get out. Because of this limitation, most of the people that are, do, are doing a refreshment that are great consumers of CO2 are using a fossil CO, uh, CO2, fossil origin CO2. They even have burners. So today, what is the direction this your, your company is going to take? Are you going to smooth 
the road? Is it part of your intention? Are you going to separate or create another category for bio CO2 to be able to be uh, uh, placed into the market? It's a very good question. Uh, I also wasn't aware that about the difficulties with uh, biogenic CO2 in for Coca-Cola or food grades. Uh, we did it. We don't have the plans, maybe yet, on setting quality requirements. Uh, we plan to only focus on the origin of the uh, product of the certificates. That's also where, yeah, where we have some expertise. Um, but yeah, it's something we can think about, and if we have for more discussions with other stakeholders, and we see there's uh, a need for it, maybe we can work together with some other organizations that. Have more experience in this uh, the quality. Bet, the, the bet noir, the real dangerous part of CO2 from bio origin is a smell. This is what they're absolutely fearful. And they don't even want to talk about it. So this is a very interesting situation. You have a double-edged sword. If suddenly you are going to go and say, oh no, we're going to take 99.99 um, .99 quality CO2 to ensure it's good. You are going to create a great problem for the producers such as us to be able to develop that technology. The cost of per ton is going to sh shoot a uh, 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 rocket high. You see, so there is a commitment that has to arrive in a way that you use the right technology to be able to ensure that the smell is odorless. And that's, that's part of the, of the situation that you are going to face. And it's extremely interesting because I think you will be or you have to become some kind of a union, uh, 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 a point of union of both sides, customers and producers. Uh, definitely points will, will take up the, the quality and we didn't speak that much yet with the with the end users of biogen or CO of carbon or CO2 in, in general. Um, but we'll do it and yeah we'll focus extra on the on the food grade type of uh, CO2. Thanks for the for the input on this. Is there another question? Maybe for another panelist. Uh, Thibaut, I was quite surprised by the data you showed. I mean, 110 nuclear reactors. I mean, that can not be go well in every country, I guess. But I mean, we're talking about this amount only for renewable uh, synthetic fuels. So do you have extra data? How does it go at EU level? Do you think the policy-wise they have this in mind? So, so just to make to be very clear, I didn't advocate for development of nuclear reactors at that magnitude everywhere because uh, there is a civil choice to be made behind. Uh, right. It's just the the magnitude of the low carbon electricity that is needed to comply with the regulation. Uh, honestly, I don't think the European Commission really calculated how, how much electricity it means uh, for the new regulation. Uh, but, but nonetheless, what I think it tells us is that we need to be very clear as a community that e-fuels, we're going to need e-fuels, so we need to start developing the industrial sectors producing e-fuels because uh, for the aviation, for the margin transport, we won't have the choice. We're going to need some e-fuels. But at the same time, because the cost in electricity, the, the, how much electricity we're going to need, and this is just talking about aviation and maritime, but a lot of different sectors are going to need some uh, low carbon electricity. We need to make sure that those e-fuels that are really dedicated for energy services where we don't have an alternative. It means, to be honest, that uh, all the different leverages like sobriety, energy efficiency, everything needs to be explored to its full potential even before the complete deployment of e-fuel. Of course. Uh, the number stuck with me. Can you remind us how many uh, windmills it was? Oh, honestly, I, I don't remember. I think it should be like uh, there may be you have more than two thousand. Yeah, at the European le level for 2050. That's a lot. I think we have a question. Uh, yeah, uh, it's a, a personal uh, thing, maybe. Uh, but we have a lot of talk, of course, about renewable fuels, power 2x these days, and we hear a lot of numbers, and 
that also today there's a lot of focus on uh, CO2, of course, and, and power. Uh, I'm just thinking that that the, the, uh, the stage of development for the electrolysis is, is overlooked. I mean, uh, I mean, to produce hydrogen of this order of magnitude is, I mean, in my opinion, not practical with today's technology. I mean, yeah, you can have elec electrolyzers, and yes, they work, and it's proven technology ex existed for 100 years. But today, the biggest uh, stack is one megawatt, and, and to uh, produce uh, renewable uh, fuels of a commercial uh, magnitude, uh, I mean, you need uh, maybe gigawatts, so you need a thousand stacks, uh, a thousand transformers, or maybe a little less if you combine them, but, but still, I mean, the order is and, and the stacks reliability is also still uh, a challenge, so you will never finish uh, fixing one electrolyzer before you can go to the next one. Uh, and and I, I'm see, I just see some practicalities uh, in all this talk, talking about re renewable fuels. Uh, technology works, but uh, we need some step changes on electrolysis to make it happen. Does anyone want to? Yeah, I, can take it. I, can take I, I think you're completely correct. Uh, I think uh, when you look at the value chain for e fumes, some technological bricks are already mature because they come from petrochemistry. For instance, the fish trap process, which is able to convert carbon monoxide and hydrogen together to produce fumes, this has been industrialized already. But there are some technological bricks which are bottlenecks because they are not fully mature. And to name only two, the capture of CO2, especially capturing CO2 from the atmosphere, is one and the electrolysis of water for producing H2 is another one. So for instance, so th there are a lot of developments. For instance, CA has developed, has created a joint venture, which is called Genvia, last year, to really look at the industrialization of one uh, technology for production of uh, H2 from electrolysis. What we need to remember is the fact that uh, today, 85% of energy primary sources come from fossil energies, meaning that it's just digging a hole in the earth and extracting chemical energy from the ground. What we are trying to achieve to reach the carbon neutrality is to electrify everything. And at some point, there is like a, a big change of paradigm, which is how are we going to store electricity in the form of chemical energy? This is what elec electrolysis is doing, but we have never implemented it at such a large scale. We have done it for, for instance, for aluminum production, but not for really storing massive amounts of electricity. So this is just strategically, we need to look more and more into electrolysis and to develop it on the industrial scale. We don't just don't have any choice. What it also means from a strategic point of view is that if you put a lot of efforts in electrolysis, those efforts are going to be utilized at the end which is important in terms of the mobilization of resources, skills, money, etc. Thank you. Do we have any other question? No. So I think we're getting to the end. Um, would the panelists like to make a last statement for the end? Well, uh, I can give one, which I already kind of uh, outlined in the end of my presentation that that uh, also you have mentioned that the commission will come up with the industrial carbon management strategy and I think there probably will be some new and uh, very much welcome new um, ideas regarding carbon capture and utilization but I think it's not going to be enough. So we will need to work on the policy because there's clearly some, all of the things you just mentioned, these need to be taken in consideration when we are building up into the 2050 climate target. We cannot put our eggs in the basket that we don't know like if it's gonna break in five years or 10 or 15, that we need to be sure that these things that we are putting our uh, hopes and dreams and all, all, all of the, um, efforts in that they actually can uh, provide the outcomes that we want. And yeah, 
I have it in mind. And this is actually the work of uh, CO2 Value Europe to make sure that uh, the institutions have in mind these elements. Thanks. <laughs>